Well, thank you, uh, worship team, for leading us today in worship. It's always good for God's people to take some time to come together like this and to worship the Lord. You know, our, uh, our, our mission statement as a church here at The Rock is the intentional pursuit of God here, there, or the intentional pursuit of Jesus here, there, and everywhere. And today I want us to look at the story of uh, two men. They were both very wealthy men, and they were both what would appear at least to be intentionally pursuing Jesus, but they weren't, uh, they weren't, they weren't, they don't both end, the, the story doesn't end the same way. And um, so we're going to look at that. We're gonna, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 18 today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke 18 verses 18 to 27, and then also Luke 19, 1 to 10. So in Luke chapter 18, verses, starting at verse 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit, you shall not, sorry, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, and because he was very wealthy, because he was very wealthy, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Just getting a little feedback up here at the, on the stage. I don't know if you guys are hearing that out there, but, but I'm hearing it pretty good up here. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Okay, so there's that story. And then we flip over to Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. And, this, and here we read, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your word and for um, just the reading of your word. We thank you for how it does... Um, it's, 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 it's a gift from you to us that we can know you by reading it and by reading these stories about the time in which Jesus dwelt on this earth and the interactions that he had with various people. We can learn about who you truly are rather than just our best guess at what we think you should be. And Lord, I pray that as we unpack your word today, Lord, that it would just speak to each one of us and, and that we would be able to take something from this and, 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 and use it throughout our week. Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege that it is to stand here and to be the vessel for you to speak through. And I just pray that you would be able to do that at this time unhindered. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin with the story of what, what's called the rich young ruler. And in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three synoptic Gospels as they're called, um, there's this story. So whenever there's a story and it's recorded in three out of the four Gospels, it's probably, you know, really important for us to, to take note of this story and go, 
what am I supposed to take from it? Like, why is this story so important that it would be included in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And, and as we look at the story, different aspects are, are brought out in each of the Gospels. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but, but Mark does tell us that this man who was rich and was young and had a place of authority, had significant influence in his, in his uh, culture, he literally comes to Jesus and he falls at his feet and he clasps Jesus' ankles. And he, and he literally is asking him a, a very important question. And the question is, what must I do to have eternal life? Now, you know, when you look at it, this, this is quite an interesting story. Because how many people do you know that are not only rich, and, and, and the Bible talks about, in, about this guy is not just rich, but he was very rich. He's not just very rich, though. He's also young. I mean, if you do know a rich person, more often than not, they're not young, they're older, because it takes a while to get wealth, usually. About, above that, though, he also has a very prominent place of authority in his community. He's very influential. He's the kind of guy who we would look at and we'd go, there's a guy who has it all together. Have you ever thought about somebody that just comes to your mind and you go, that guy, he has it. He has it all together. I think our world does that all the time. We're always out there looking for who it is that we think has it all together. Well, this guy seems to have it all together. And yet, he knows that something seems to be missing in his life. Why is he coming to Jesus? He's coming to Jesus because he looks at Jesus and he's thinking, that guy has whatever it is that I don't have. Now, we can see that in the, in the ones that are sick and the ones that are demon-possessed and the, the ones that are whatever ailment they might have, that they would be coming to Jesus. But here we have this young, rich ruler who is coming to Jesus and, as Mark tells us, falling at Jesus' feet, clasping his ankles and asking him a very serious question, what must I do to have eternal life? And yet from the story, we discover that something's missing. He identifies Jesus here as not only a teacher, but he says to him, good teacher. He calls Jesus good. And Jesus right away corrects him on that. How many of you like to be corrected when you say something? We, we, we don't like that, right? We're kind of like, that's kind of rude. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't call me good, Jesus says. Some, some uh, critics of, of, of the faith have said that this is proof right here that Jesus did not see himself as God because he's very clear to say no one is good but God. That's not really what Jesus is saying. He's not saying I'm not God. What he's doing is he's saying, do you even not realize what you're actually saying? Do you know what you're saying when you call me good teacher? Because there's only one that's good, and that is God. You know, one of the songs we were singing earlier is how God is good and gracious. I think we've kind of belittled that word good, you know? Um, if you asked 100 people, I bet you 99 of them would say that they're good. Most people, if you say, are you a good person? They would say, of course I'm a good person. Why? Well, because I'm better than so-and-so over there. There's actually a story about that just before this story about, um, we won't go into that one, but the, uh, the, Fer the, Pharis or the Pharisee and the, the tax collector as they both go up to the temple to pray, right? And the Pharisee's talking about how good he is. Well, why is he good? Well, he's good because he's good in comparison to the tax collector. So the, the ways that we think, it's always interesting to me, the ways that we think today have not changed at all in, in 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, the people back then, even with way less technology than we have today, Believe it or not, they thought just the same way as you and I do today. They thought, okay, who is good? And God says, God is the only one. Jesus says, God is the only one who is good. So he's, he's, he's correcting them because he's saying, what you're actually saying is you're saying that I'm God if you're calling me good teacher. You're not just affirming me or complimenting me, but you're identifying me as God. Do you realize that that's what you're doing? And then he asks, you know, what must I do to have eternal life? And, and Jesus' answer is quite interesting because he says, well, I'm going to give you a little test here, essentially. 
I'm going to run through some of the uh, Ten Commandments, and I don't know why Jesus puts them in the order that he does. He doesn't put them in the same order as they're found in, in Exodus and in, in Deuteronomy, but he gives a sampling of the Ten Commandments. It's interesting when you look at those, though, some of the ones that he leaves out. Because, you know, what, what I've found is I've found that, that when it comes to the Ten Commandments, you and I probably struggle with, with different ones. There might be one or two there that I struggle with more than you do, and one or two there that you struggle with more than I do. In reality, we all struggle with all of them, but there's always those ones that we struggle with in particularly. And what's interesting is I think Jesus leaves out the two that, that this man really was struggling with. Because he says to him, he says, you know, well, here, here's a sampling of the Ten Commandments, and, and the man says, I've kept all of those since I was a young boy. You see, the Jews back then, they, they believed, well, they still do today, that, that there's a coming of age. When you get to be about 12 years old, then you have this bar mitzvah, and you are now uh, recognized as an adult, and, and you are recognized as somebody who's responsible now for your actions. And so he's going back to when he would have had his bar mitzvah, and he's saying that since I came of age and I had that important ceremony in my life, I have been keeping all of these commandments very carefully. Well, the two that he's missing that Jesus doesn't say right away, there's more than that. He's only, he only mentions five of them. But, but the two that, that really, I think, captures what he's struggling with here is that the commandment, the last one, do not covet. Because coveting is, is not something that we do outwardly and everybody can see it. It's something that we do inwardly. And it's when we desire to have something. And this man clearly has a problem with his money. And with his wealth. And it, with wealthy people, even when they're very wealthy, they still want more. It's like, how much is enough? Well, just a little bit more, right? And, and so that is, that's covetousness. It's to always desire and de driven and, and I've got to have more. And then, of course, the other commandment that really he seems to be lacking is, um, is the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, this man, whether he realizes it or not, he has a God before God, and, and that God is, is money. And, and so Jesus is just going to point this out to him. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Not just wealthy, but very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you hear enough pastors preach on this passage, you're going to hear some story about how in those days, there was this um, gate around Jerusalem, and there was this narrow entry called the Eye of the Needle, and that the camel had to take everything off of its back, and that it had to get down on its knees so that it could fit through this entrance called the Eye of the Needle, and that it wasn't impossible for a camel to go through the Eye of the Needle. It was just very difficult, and he had to unload everything that he had first, and that's the whole... No. <laughs> I don't know where that exactly came from, but Jesus is using hyperbole here. He's taking the greatest biggest animal in their, in their world, in their culture, the camel, and he's comparing it to the smallest opening that they can imagine, which is the little eye that you put a piece of thread through in a needle. And he's saying, that's how hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. It's like, he wants them to look at that and think about that and go, it's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. And that's exactly what they do in verse 26. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? It's impossible. And the reason they think it's impossible is because the way they looked at this man is they looked at, here's a young guy. He's young, he's rich, and he's already been elevated to a key part in his community that carries authority and influence. And they looked at all of that and they thought, here's a man who is blessed God's blessing is clearly upon this guy. And so as they think about it, and they're like, this is a guy who's blessed, and he has this respect amongst the people. And they think, if, if he can't be saved, well, then who can be saved? 
And Jesus just says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And we have that the man walks away very sad because he had great wealth. Now, how many of us, when we look at people who, according to the world at least, seem to have it all together, we look at them and we want to be like them. We want to have what they have. Jesus looks at this guy and he's, he's pitying him. He's like, how hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. And we're left kind of like in this story with a little bit like, well, you know, we live in a pretty affluent culture, right? I mean, what does this say about all of us? I mean, I mean, I don't think anybody in this room would be identified in our culture anyways as very wealthy. But compared to the rest of the world, we're probably all identified as quite well off. This story is a little troubling. But then you come to the very next chapter and you come to this story about Zacchaeus. And I think um, where this story leaves off about the rich young ruler with a lot of questions unanswered, we come to Zacchaeus and I think some of those questions get some answers. And that's why I like to parallel the two stories. So we come to Zacchaeus here in, uh, in Luke chapter 19. We'll flip over to there at this time. Um, told that Jesus was entering through the, the city of Jericho, and as he was going through the city of Jericho, he, he was just passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. We're told that this man was a chief tax collector and that he too was wealthy. So this man has a, has a, has a position of, of authority in his community. This man is wealthy. But unlike the first guy, this man is not respected. In fact, the common people think of him as as a traitor. You see, in those days, the Romans put heavy taxes on the other cultures that were underneath them, the other, the other peoples. And one of those peoples were the Israelites. And the Romans put heavy, heavy taxes on them so that they could pay for all of their fancy stuff that the Romans had, their military and everything else. And what they would do is they would uh, identify some, some people in the community who obviously had a desire to get well, to get, to get rich, and they would... They would s- single them out as potential people who might be willing to take on the position of, of a tax collector. And if you could become a tax collector, it was very advantageous if you wanted to be well off, but it was a very big negative if you wanted to fit in with the rest of your culture. Because the people saw you, like I said, as a traitor. You were collecting taxes to give that money to the group that was oppressing the people. And so in, in that system, you were just going to continue to stay under this oppression of the Romans. If that wasn't bad enough, the way that the tax collector really got rich was he would take more than what he had to. Like he would, he would bid on that area so that he would say, well, I can collect this much taxes for the Romans from the people here. And then he would collect even more than that so that he could pad his own pockets. And the people clearly knew that he, he was doing this. And Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector like Matthew, the disciple, but Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector in the area. So he was kind of like the tax collector over all the other tax collectors. We can see why, unlike the first guy, the rich young ruler, he was not well liked. He liked the rich young ruler, though. He realizes that something in his life is missing. I mean, he's got wealth. He's got a, a, you know, a, a high position. He doesn't have respect like the first guy did. But nonetheless, he senses that something is missing, and he senses that maybe Jesus has what he's looking for. And so he, too, is intentionally pursuing Jesus, here, there, and everywhere. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. We get an idea there of how, how popular Jesus is at this point. I mean, yeah, this guy's short, and so we can't see over the crowd. But, like, if you go to a parade, you can usually see some opening in the crowd that you can kind of get in, and then you can kind of work your way in, and then you can, you can kind of see what's going on in the parade, even if you're short and you can't see over the big tall guy in front of you, right? But the crowd was so densely thick that he couldn't get by. And the only thing he could think to do was to, to run up ahead of where Jesus was going and climb up a tree. Now, remember, this guy is a chief tax collector. He's wealthy. This was not a very dignified thing for him to do. Running up ahead 
ha, 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 because he can't see over the tall guys, and he has to climb up into a tree. You can imagine as the, uh, the guys didn't like him to begin with, they probably thought that was pretty funny to see Zacchaeus up there in a tree. Um, but he doesn't seem to care about his dignity at this point. He wants to see Jesus. So verse 4, so he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus calls him by name. Some people have asked the question, well, how did Jesus know his name? And some people have said that um, Jesus knows our name from the, before we were even born. And maybe this is a, an illustration of that, that, that Jesus knew Zacchaeus long before they ever had this interaction, because Jesus, after all, is God. He calls him by name. He tells him, you need to come down from the tree, and you need to come down immediately. And then he says, because I must stay at your house today. One thing is, is with God, there are no coincidences. There are no just happenings, just, just things that will just happen to take place today in our day. Everything with Jesus seems to happen for a purpose. It's like he's on this divine agenda that the Father has given him all along. He's not just passing through Jericho because he felt like going for a walk and happened to bump into Zacchaeus. He's walking through Jericho because he needs to see Zacchaeus. You see, Zacchaeus was up in the tree, not just so that Zacchaeus could see Jesus, but Zacchaeus was up in the tree so that Jesus could see Zacchaeus. And Jesus looks up, sees Zacchaeus, and calls for him to come down, and come down because I must stay at your house today. Have you ever thought about how this story is a living illustration of the verse that we find in Revelation 3, verse 20, where Jesus says, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and says, I must stay at your house today. This is an invitation. This week we were doing soccer camp and it was really cool. And I, I enjoyed having the opportunity to spend with the kids. Because unfortunately I don't, I don't get to see the kids a lot on Sunday. I mean, on Sunday I see them running here and there. And I hear them crying while I'm trying to preach and these kind of things. Just things that happen, right? And, and, but I don't even know all their names, you know? It, I mean... But this week, being able to spend like a whole week, day after day with them, it was one of the real um, joys of it was just getting to know not just their names, but getting to know a little bit about them, about their personality, about who they are and all these things. Well, one of the things we were focusing on was we were giving these kids an invitation. Because we don't know, not all the kids came from the churches, and even the kids that go to church, they still need the invitation to receive Jesus. That he stands at their door and he knocks. And he wants them to open the door of their life and welcome Jesus in. And you know, he stands at the door of every single one of us, our life. And no one else but us can go to the door and open it up for him. Jesus stands there knocking, waiting for you to open the door. You have to open the door. Zacchaeus had to open the door. And when I hear that, I must stay at your house today... It makes me also think of how we sort of have this assumption, and I don't, it's not anywhere in Scripture, but we have this assumption that we know that after we die in this life, if Jesus was knocking at the door of your life and you refuse to let him in, we know that once you die here on earth, that's biblical, that your time is up, that you've missed your opportunity and you can't let him into your house now after you die. But with that, we assume that while you're here on earth, You've got your whole life to make this decision. But then we read stories like this and we're like, this seems to be Zacchaeus' opportunity here. Jesus is saying, come down, I must stay at your house today. In other words, he's not saying, hey Zacchaeus, it might be a good idea if you came down because today would be a good day to let me in, but you know what, tomorrow will work too. No, he says, I must stay at your house today. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about how when Jesus is knocking at the door of your life, you don't put it off? 
You don't say, well, I'll get around to that next week, next month, next year, maybe after I've lived a little. No. I must stay at your house today. It says Zacchaeus in verse 6, so, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Zacchaeus is like, you bet. You want to come into my life? You want to be friends with me? See, Zacchaeus had the wealth, he had the authority, but he didn't have the respect and he didn't have the friends. And all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, I'll be your friend. Come on down. Zacchaeus thinks, this is, this is great. I can't believe this is actually happening to me. He scrambles down the tree, and he immediately welcomes Jesus in. And it's an example to you and me of how we should respond to such an incredible invitation. Verse 7, we get a picture of how all the people think about Zacchaeus. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. See how they look at it? With them, it's like, I'm good because I'm better than Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a sinner. With Jesus, it's like no one is good but God. And what does that make all of us? We're the sinners. None of us deserve Jesus to come into our life any more or any less than Zacchaeus did. And I think that when it comes back to the rich young ruler, one of the reasons that Jesus pities him is not just because of all of his money, but because of his reputation that he thinks he's earned and all the stuff that he thinks he's done, and he's become such a self-made person that he just doesn't seem to sense how important it is that he would welcome Jesus in, that that's all that really matters. All that other stuff, let it go. Verse 8, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. When I read that, I, I feel like maybe something's missing. I don't hear Jesus explaining to Zacchaeus, well, this is the ABCs of salvation. You know, you need to admit that you're a sinner, you need to believe, and you need to confess that Jesus is Lord. I don't hear him saying, well, you need to pray a prayer, you need to walk an aisle, you need to sign your name at the back of a Bible. All those things are good. And maybe those things even happen, but they're not here in the story. What is here in the story? What is here in the story is Zacchaeus' actions. And it's not his actions that got him saved. Jesus, Jesus put out this invitation to him before he did anything. But once Jesus puts out this invitation and Zacchaeus responds to the invitation... Then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes into Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus starts to, starts to be convicted about things. All of a sudden, he's a new person. He's, he's born again. All of the things that he thought were so important aren't important anymore, and he's like, I've done wrong. He feels convicted. He is admitting he's a sinner. Not because Jesus said, well, just say these words, and then you're good, but because of his actions. His actions show what he does. His actions show that he recognizes who he is. His actions show that he knows who he needs to trust in. And then, in verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So we have the story of two people today. One man was willing to repent. And I believe that that is, that is the key to this. What is the difference between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus? What, at the end of the day, what's the big difference? You know what the big difference is? Repentance. Repentance, that's the big difference. You see, the rich young ruler, this was his life. And I, I illustrated this a few months ago, but I want to illustrate it again. This was, this was the rich young ruler. Going through his life, acquiring wealth, acquiring authority, acquiring um, leadership. Still has got youth and his whole life to look forward to. He's going through his life. And all of a sudden he sees Jesus over there. And he's like, there's still something missing in my life. 
And, and, he, and he makes a big, big statement by going to Jesus and asking, what must I do? And, and he falls even on, on his, at Jesus' feet and asks Jesus for something. But at the end of the day, what he wants is he wants Jesus to come along with him so that they can just keep going along their merry way as he keeps going his way, that he's always been going. Now, Zacchaeus, this is his life. He's going along, and he's found a way to make lots of money too, and he's become the chief tax collector, and people don't like him very much, but after all, maybe to him money is more important than friends and these kinds of things, and he sees Jesus over there. And when he sees Jesus over there, he's like, I'm going the wrong way. I am going to turn around, and I'm going to go with Jesus this way. And, and he shows that by saying, you know what? I've hurt people, and I'm going to make it right. If I've, if I've ripped anybody off, I'm going to give them back, not just what I've ripped them off, but I'm going to give them back four times. And not only that, but I, do, I have acquired a lot of wealth, but it's not all for me to just hold on to tightly. I'm going to give half of it away to the poor, because I don't need it all. And this is, he's not doing this to earn anything from Jesus, but he's doing this because he's following Jesus already. The one man repented. The other man kept going his way. He wanted Jesus to join him and keep going his way. Jesus can come along too if he wants. The other man turned around and went with Jesus, Jesus' way. That's the difference. So what about you? What about me? Are we like Zacchaeus, or are we like the rich young ruler? I've looked at people in our culture today, and I notice those ones that seem to have it all. And sometimes I'm tempted to, to envy them, and I'm like, man, it'd be nice to have the things that they have. They seem to have so many great things. But then I think about how Jesus looks at the people who in our world seem to have it all. And it's not that it's impossible for them to have eternal life, but it's so much harder. Jesus doesn't envy that. He actually pities that. Because, you know, when you look at the people who seem to have it all together, you kind of ask yourself a question, and the question is, do they even need Jesus? And then I think about how Jesus didn't envy them. He pitied them and said how hard it is for them to enter the kingdom of God. And then I think about this last verse here. Verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The reason we don't envy the ones that have it all together, we actually should feel some sympathy or some pity almost toward them. It's because it's really hard for them to realize that them, just like all of us, are lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, of which I am one of those lost. And I hope you realize today that you are one of those lost. And that you don't want to go your way and have Jesus jump in there and join you, but that you realize, I don't want to keep going this way because this way is lost. I want to be found. That's going this way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these two stories. And we could look at them all day long, really. They're amazing stories that um, really illustrate the importance of letting go of whatever it is that we think is so important and going your way, even if that means um, letting go of some of our wealth or letting go of the name that we've made for ourselves and our community or letting go of some friends, whatever it might mean. Lord, may we be willing to let those things go so that we can follow you and that we can experience the joy of salvation rather than the sadness of hanging on to our stuff. Lord, I just ask that um, if there's anybody here today who hasn't made that decision yet, that today is the day that you're knocking at the door of their life and you're wanting them to let you in, that, Lord, they would make that decision today, realizing that today might be the day that you must come in because this is the opportunity. And so I pray for that, Lord, and I ask in Jesus' name.